Welcome to our August uh, San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council meeting. Uh, just as a reminder, who is the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council? Um, it's a group of urban forest stakeholders from the private, public, nonprofit sectors, all with the same focus on uh, enhancing the uh, urban forests of, you know, collectively San Diego region, but even beyond that, we, we play a role on a statewide scale. Uh, we are affiliated uh, basically as um, we're a chapter of the California Urban Forest Council. And in fact, Megan Shaw, our presenter today, sits on the board of directors for the California Urban Forest Council representing this region. So, um, so yeah, we meet uh, every other month uh, in this forum. We've been doing virtual since COVID hit. And like I kind of mentioned earlier, I feel like it's, it's been a pretty good success. We're, we're um, able to get quite a few uh, good participation in these meetings. So uh, I have on the screen here, hopefully everybody can see this. We have an agenda. I'm gonna try and use this as uh, our guiding uh, document and uh, we're gonna hear our presentation um, and then we're gonna take a little bit of a break, grab your lunch, do whatever you gotta do for a good 20 minutes or so. And then uh, we'll jump back into the meeting right around 12.20. And then uh, we'll hear some local updates and kind of give everybody a chance if you want to add to the meeting, we'll uh, you know, kind of keep that as an open opportunity to hear what's happening in your neck of the woods or what kind of things you're doing in regards to uh, helping the urban forest. So uh, with that, the topic today is urban forestry on the private property, debunking the myths. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I remember a few years ago, there was this LIDAR analysis done in San Diego County. And for me, it was one of the biggest eye-opening pieces were, was the reality that if we really want to enhance or, or find the best opportunity places to enhance the urban forest. It's not the parkway trees, it's not the park trees, it's not the golf course trees, it's really the private property trees. That's where the biggest voids, the biggest opportunities to enhance the urban forests were located actually on private property. So I think this is a great timely message. I know there's a few projects happening in San Diego between Kate Set, the Kate Sessions Initiative and Tree San Diego's uh, Branch Out San Diego grant and even Urban Core, what they're doing with their grant. There's a lot of things happening that involved potentially touching private property. And I think this is just a very timely subject. So with that, I'd like to introduce Megan Shaw. Megan is the horticulturist for Balboa Park and a rock star active member of the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council. And grateful to have you participate, Megan. So if you wanna go ahead and take over the screen and put your presentation up, I'll, I'll shut up for a while. All right, um, I am sharing my screen. All right, can everyone see that okay? Okay, great. So as Mike said, I'm Megan Shaw. I'm the horticulturist and certified arborist over at Balboa Park with the city of San Diego Parks and Rec. Um, I'm kind of taking over for our urban forester, our city forester, Brian Widener today, who's on vacation um, to really kind of touch on some of the things that they do over in our streets and transportation department. Um, as well as other many other programs here in the county. Um, so let's dive into it. Okay, um, start with our the reason we plant trees and tree benefits. So first of all, the city of San Diego has a couple policies um, that encourage us to plant trees within city bounds. Um, and so we have a climate action plan with um, a goal to really reduce greenhouse gases. Um, we have a 2035 target on that. So we have a couple years still to try and reach our goals. And we're really looking at saving energy and water, creating more efficient buildings, um, finding better ways to create energy, making it clean and renewable, and increasing alter alternate transportation like biking, walking, transit, um, and really looking our, at our land use, um, trying to get our uh, waste down to zero and recycle more and to really kind of build up climate uh, resiliency. We also have an urban forestry program which kind of um, builds off of the climate action plan. And we really found that trees are the best way to fight climate change. And so the urban forestry program was adopted in 2017 with a five year plan. Now we've expanded that again. Um, and it's really to increase the urban tree 
canopy cover here in the city of San Diego to 35% by 2035. We're currently a bit above 14%, um, and we'll look at that in a second. So max efficiencies and maintaining benefits of trees are one of our primary goals. That's really looking at preserving our mature trees that are currently existing. But part of the um, growth of the urban canopy cover is really going to be up to uh, planting a lot more trees um, in co combination with preserving our mature trees. And then we want to minimize the risk of trees in our urban environment. So our urban forestry program really does a lot to assess the health and structure of trees and make sure they're safe for the public. Okay. So we know trees can really help um, slow the effects of climate change by absorbing and storing CO2 and other gases and pollutants. They release oxygen that we need to breathe into our atmosphere. They provide shade in our communities. They cool temperatures and through that they reduce cooling costs. Um, if they're planted properly, they can block cold winds and uh, reduce heating costs. They can reduce CO2 emissions overall just through that conservation of energy. Um, we found that you could save potentially 20 to 50% of the energy you would typically use for heating or cooling if trees are planted around your home properly. Um, they filter waterways and um, prevent flooding and landslides and soil erosion. So they really keep our soils in place. Lots of good benefits. There's more of them out there. Those are some of the ones that we've got listed here. Here's another really good graphic showing just all the different benefits that trees have to us. And you can go ahead if you're interested and click on this image, it'll bring up a larger version that you can read better. Um, but basically they're important for almost every aspect of our life and in our communities, both um, in making us healthier, um, helping us pay attention in school, giving us recreation opportunities, um, reducing energy costs, just making uh, our neighborhood safer by reducing crime and getting people out and enjoying the neighborhood more often. We also found that trees really increase the amount of business that um, different retail stores get when there's lots of trees in their area. So it shows that on a tree lined street, um, they had about 20% more income um, and that trees attract more customers to the storefront. Um, customers stay longer in the store and they end up spending more money. And it just makes the consumers more satisfied with what they're buying when they have an attractive setting to buy it in. So referencing the study that Mike was mentioning um, in the beginning here is we had an assessment of the urban canopy done here in San Diego. Um, this image here looks at council district actually within uh, city limits. So if you know which council you're in then you can look at the canopy cover for your district here. The link to really go through all the information is here at the bottom. This is really breaking it down by community so you can see the really dark green communities have the most tree uh, coverage while the lighter yellow here uh, or lighter green color has larger opportunities to plant trees. And then we can also look at it as Mike was mentioning by property. So um, what you're seeing here is a zoom in of, I think this is about the, like the North Park area. Um, and you can see by parcel where we have canopy coverage and where there are opportunities. So you can really see a lot of these homes, especially on certain streets here, have a lot of yellow showing that there's a lot of room to plant trees. Okay, and so that's what brings us to our topic today is as arborists, we are really trying to build our urban forest, especially here in the city of San Diego with those lofty climate action goals. And we're having a hard time getting private property owners to plant trees. We even have lots of free trees to give away um, 
and we'll get we'll touch on our free tree resources at the end. Um, but we're having a hard time giving away free trees. And so a lot of times we hear different concerns from homeowners and property owners about reasons why they think they don't want trees on the property. Um, and there's so many of them, we're not going to touch on all of those today. We're gonna to touch on a handful of them um, and kind of start to debunk this, those myths. So whether you're um, a resident, a property owner, or you're an arborist joining us today, um, these are some of the main things that we hear. These are tools that you can use to try and promote trees on private property and hopefully answer some of the questions that you may have. So one thing that we hear a lot in San Diego is trees need a lot of water. And we know that we have um, drought restrictions sometimes. We don't always have a lot of water to freely water landscape. Um, but we found that that's not necessarily true. Their trees require surprisingly little water after they're established. So mature trees may not even need supplemental water depending on the water requirement of that species. Um, we found per tree watering costs about $10 a year. Um, when you're watering tr an established tree, you're gonna really wanna water it deep, but it's pretty infrequent that you're gonna water that tree. Um, newly planted trees should be watered um, with up to five gallons once a week for the first three years. So they're gonna take a bit more water to get established. Um, small established low water trees need only about 20 gallons a month. And that's really only the amount that most people will use in a shower. So it's still not very much compared to the overall household usage. Large and mature low water trees need approximately 200 gallons per month. Pay attention to the soil moisture under your tree and adjust the amounts accordingly. Um, you always want to go a couple inches down when you're checking soil moisture. Um, when you're looking at a small newly planted tree, it's really important to make sure you're checking the root ball, which is um, closer to the trunk of the tree to make sure that that is moist a few inches down. A soaker hose or drips system ensures that there's no runoff or water waste. So that's a very efficient way to water if you are concerned. Um, with how much water you're using. And a four inch layer of mulch can definitely help conserve that soil moisture and may also reduce the need to water. So this is a, um, a graphic that we have up on the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council website um, that you can reference if you're wondering exactly how much water your particular tree needs. This is more for small or established, uh, sorry, for mature or established trees. And you can uh, get to that information right here at the bottom. <clears throat> and then there are plenty of trees that you can um, plant here in San Diego that are considered low water use trees, which means that they're drought tolerant um, and they don't need high volumes of water or constantly moist soil to survive. So these are just some examples that I pulled up using Select Tree, and we'll talk about Select Tree um, in a bit here. Um, but we have some pretty nice trees, even some with some color here, um, and a variety of different types of leaves and shapes. All right, another myth that we hear a lot, a big concern a lot of homeowners have, is trees are messy and or attract pests. So a lot of time what we're dealing with when we hear this is wrong tree, wrong place. People are um, probably inheriting trees a lot of the time that they're having these problems. Um, but it's really important when you're planning your yard and which trees to plant in your yard that you're really focusing on tree selection and placement. And you can solve a lot of these problems just by those two things. Um, the other thing is some tree species are dioecious, which means that individual trees are either male or female. Um, so example, this picture that we have here is a female uh, ginkgo bilboa tree. Um, and they are known to have very stinky fruit as it rots on the ground. Um, and so typically males are planted to solve that. However, it's important sometimes to have both out in the urban um, environment to, uh, to help with the trees 
biodiversity, so you may still find some females out there. But if you're overly concerned and you did want to plant that species, I would say you typically want to go with a male. Um, and then most pests can be deterred through a variety of different means, and we'll get into some of those. So pests not aren't necessarily a reason not to plant trees. There are things that you that can be done to prevent pests from really becoming a problem. So first of all, there's a lot of different types of tree litter. Um, not all trees provide uh, create a wet or messy fruit. Not all trees are going to drop a lot of leaves all the time. Um, every tree is going to drop something at some point, but the amounts and the type are uh, they vary. So it's going to vary between species, potentially between the sexes of the different individuals. Evergreen trees are going to drop a smaller quantity of, of leaves throughout the entire year, um, while di a deciduous tree is going to drop most or all of their leaves during a season. And so that's something that, can, that you may want to consider. There are many types of tree fruits. Not all of them, like I mentioned, create a wet fruit. A lot of them create a dry fruit, which is much easier to blow away or to rake up or clean. And so if um, that's one of the main concerns, you're going to want to check what type of tree fruit um, the tree may potentially create. Wet fruits typically are fleshy, so berries, droops um, are going to create a bigger mess. Rodents. So there's lots of different ways if you're concerned about your trees attracting rodents. Typically, um, rodents are going to be nesting in dense vegetation. We see them a lot in palm trees, especially Mexican fan palms and Canary Island date palms, but sometimes they'll nest in other types of trees. Um, as the other major thing is fruit trees. If you are trying to grow fruit trees in your yard, you're going to have a bigger issue with pests, um, especially rodents, because there is a food source. So prevention is really key. You want to keep your yard free of food. Um, keep lids on trash cans, keep your bird feeders inaccessible, so you probably want to hang them from something. Um, limit nesting places, wood piles, or any thick vegetation. There are um, a couple other species of wildlife that are good biological control, so any type of snake, um, owls and raptors will keep your rodent populations down. Um, you can put perches up to increase the amount of raptors that visit your yard. Proper spacing of your new trees is important. You want to make sure that the branches don't touch each other or other structures once they're at their mature size. That will prevent rodents from being able to travel from tree canopy to tree canopy or from a fence to your tree. Um, if you have existing trees, you may want to regularly prune them, especially fruit trees, to keep their branches away from structures or other trees. Um, again, for that same reason, you can use trunk guards, um, especially metal trunk guards that um, can be put around the tree that will prevent rodents from being able to climb up the base of the tree. And there is always rodent traps. So if you are having a big problem, you can use a variety of different types of traps to trap and control your rodent population. Birds. So most species of birds are not typically considered pests and they are protected um, federally by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So it is illegal to harm protect to harm uh, these protected birds or disrupt their reproductive cycle. And nesting season typically lasts from February to September. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the following control methods really should be used as a prevention um, to keep birds from nesting in your trees if that's something you're concerned about, but should not be used to scare birds that are actively nesting. Um, so you can use animal decoys. They make a variety of different types of animal decoys like um, owls, coyotes, there's moving ones. There's all different types of different decoys out there. Um, shiny object objects like you can hang CD-ROMs or um, metal, like not metal, a shiny ribbon that you make to hang from trees that scares birds from entering the tree. 
Um, if you have fruit trees and you're having problems with birds eating your fruit, there's always some netting that you can use to cover the canopy um, if it's a smaller tree. There, they make electronic scaring devices, both motion and sound. If you're having a big issue with uh, bird droppings over a driveway or on a car, um, you may be able to do selective trimming um, to remove a particular branch that's a problem or always just use covers on your car or if in your pool if you're having other issues um, with leaves or, or ducks or something. Okay, and then it's important that you know um, not uh, basically how not to scare birds when you are working on trees. And so there's a couple good training or best management practices out there. There's the Tree Care for Birds and Other Wildlife um, website and best management practices that train tree care workers how to assess um, habitat value and nesting. Um, of birds to make sure that they're following the laws and really taking care of the birds when they're working in trees. Um, it's going to sorry, it's going to minimize any impacts to wildlife, and it helps um, prepare for projects to ass assess the area to make sure that you're not going to need a biologist out there. Okay, there's a really great. Uh, matrix that was made here to determine whether you have high or low habitat value. Um, and that's gonna determine whether you need a biologist or not. Some of the things that you're gonna wanna consider if you do have nesting birds are the duration of the work, what time of year it is, what tools you're gonna use, what species of birds you have, um, how far the active nest is from the work that needs to be completed, um, if it has eggs in it or young, or if it's being built, the status of the nest, and if you're in a rural versus an urban area, um, different environmental conditions. Um, and then I use select tree here to give you examples of trees that are gonna have a dry um, fruit and that are evergreen. So they're gonna have um, less leaves fall, at least that one season. Um, and so these shouldn't be too messy. These are good trees to use if you're concerned with um, cleaning up a mess for trees. All right, I don't have enough space in my yard for a tree, okay? Um, that is a pretty decent concern. A lot of people do have small patios or small yards and trees typically do need a good amount of space. However, they do come in many shapes and sizes. There are many small growing uh, species of trees out there. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is just assess your, the space you do have available and what your site limitations are before you choose trees for your yard. Um, and you also want to make sure when you're choosing a tree, you're planning for the mature um, height and width of the tree. Small trees um, can require a tree well as small as three feet by three feet. Um, and you can also get creative. So in this image we have here, um, we have a bit of a, a platform created. So it's giving the tree a bit more space um, to have its roots, but you can still use that area without impacting the tree. Um, so bridging over the roots or creating a platform is a great way to kind of get a dull use of your space, but we would recommend an arborist um, help design and oversee that project. Here are some examples of small trees that are gonna get smaller or that are going to grow smaller than 25 feet high and less than 20 feet wide. Um, the western redbud is a native tree and it's as well as a uh, toyon and those are two good choices for San Diego. Some some of these are considered small large shrubs or small trees um, however they anything that has a woody mass is also going to have a um, carbon sequestration benefit to it. All right, tree roots will crack foundations and lift concrete. Okay. In some cases, tree roots can 
uh, crack foundations and lip concrete. But most often this is a case of wrong tree, wrong place, like this large ficus tree that was planted um, at the edge of the roadway between the sidewalk here. The uh, different species have different root damage potential ratings and you can find those um, on select tree. Uh, trees planted near hardscape or structures or foundations really should have a, a root damage potential rating of low to moderate, um, depending on what kind of space you have available. Um, proper spacing and selection are really key to avoiding infrastructure conflicts. And again, plan for the height and the width um, at maturity. In general, the tree roots are gonna extend out about 1.5 times the canopy of the tree. So they're gonna extend pretty far past the actual tree itself. Um, and you should remember that 60% of the most important uh, absorbing roots of those of the tree is actually past the canopy. So it does, it is important to keep some area accessible past that drip line. Okay. And again, using select tree, I did a search just looking at trees with low root damage potential for here in San Diego County. Um, and we do have a lot of different trees that, even large trees that have low uh, root damage potential ratings. All right, trees increase fire risk. There uh, was a really great pre presentation done by Lynette Short, who is our CAL FIRE um, area forester, I believe. Um, and so I took some of these slides from her presentation. Um, lessons from CAL FIRE, trees near structures do stay intact during and after wildfires. Um, they found the main cause of structure loss is fire brands or embers that are carried far distance by winds and homes burned due to inadequate fire resistant materials and lack of defensible space. The trees didn't burn the house. So here's a couple good examples out of San Diego the cedar fire from 20, uh, 2003. You can see very clearly here that we have pretty much our entire eucalyptus forest intact, but an uh, entire neighborhood of homes that had burned. All the green and the trees are pretty much still intact. Here's another example. Uh, this is an aerial shot. So defensible space is really important. Um, Assembly Bill 3074 passed in 2020 that creates a new zone for areas that are considered high fire risk. Um, they have until 2023 uh, to come out with the specifics on that, but it's basically an ember resistant zone and it extends about five feet from any buildings, structures, and zec decks. Um, and see, basically they want um, people in high fire risk areas to use hard skate, skate in, these er in that area, that zone, um, like gravels, pavers, and concretes, anything that's non-combustible, not using bark or mulch, which can catch on fire, oops, sorry. Um, to remove any dead and dying weeds, grass, plants, shrubs, trees, branches, and vegetation. They always check your roof gutters. Uh, remove all branches within 10 feet of any chimney or, sto of sto or stove pipe. <clears throat> Limit plants in the area to low growing, non-woody, and properly watered and maintained. Limit combustible items. Relocate firewood and lumber replace combustible fencing, gates, anchors um, that attach the home with anything that's non-combustible. Consider relocating garbage and recycling containers and boats, RVs, vehicles, anything that's combustible. And then zone one, which extends um, 30 feet from buildings in any situation, high fire or non-high fire areas, uh, and remove all dead plants, grass, and weeds. Remove 
dead, dry leaves, pine needles from your yard, roof, and rain gutters. Remove branches that hang over your roof and keep dead branches 10 feet from your chimney. Trim trees regularly to keep branches about 10 feet away from each other. Relocate wood piles. Remove or prune flammable plants and shrubs near windows. <clears throat> Remove vegetation and items that could catch fire from around or under decks, balconies, and stairs. Create a separation between trees, shrubs, and items that can catch fire. Okay. And then finally, zone two uh, extends from 30 feet to 100 feet from any buildings or structures. And here they want you to cut or mow annual grass down to a maximum height of four inches. Create horizontal space between trees and shrubs. Create vertical space between grass, shrubs, and trees. Remove fallen leaves, needles, twigs, bark, cones, and small branches. Um, and ex uh, exposed wood piles should have a minimum, minimum of 10 feet clearance down to bare minimum soil in all directions. Okay, so vertical spacing. Um, there's a diagram here. Remove all tree branches to at least six feet from the ground. Allow extra vertical space between shrubs and trees. Lack of vertical space can allow fire to move from the ground to the brush to the tree top like a ladder. This leads to more intense fire closer to your home. Determine the proper vertical spacing between the shrubs and the lowest branches of the tree. And horizontal spacing um, depends on the slope um, of the land and the height of the shrub of the tree. So you're gonna reference the diagram here. And here's a, um, a couple examples of fire resistant trees. And there's an entire list um, available at this link here um, of all plants that are suggested for defense, defensible space for San Diego County. Um, not just trees, but shrubs and other types of plants as well. Um, but we have a couple different trees um, as examples here. Coast Live Oak is a native tree that um, is pretty fire resistant. So is our strawberry trees and Chinese elm trees. Okay, so when you're choosing a tree for your property, um, what do you really wanna consider? So really assess the space that you have available. You need to know what your site limitations are. Um, do you have sunlight in the area? What is your water availability? Or do you have irrigation available? What's the soil texture like? Um, you need to know what your underground or overhead utilities are and where they're located. Um, where you have hardscape or structures that you don't want impacted by trees. What your functional goals for the tree are. So are you looking to get shade from the tree, screen and privacy, windbreak, is it for aesthetics or some type of architectural um, element? Fruits and nuts, so food source, slope, um, or soil stabilization. And there's also the chance that you can increase wildlife in your yard by providing them habitat. Be a variety of those different things that you're hoping to achieve. So right tree, right place is really important, especially around utilities. Um, here in San Diego County, we have SDG&E and Davey Resource Group um, is the contractor that does the vegetation inspections for SDG&E. So if you're a homeowner, you're probably familiar um, as, long as, you, as long as you have power lines in your area, you probably get a visit from them. Um, so they're gonna come around each year and monitor the vegetation growing around any of those utilities, um, trees that are growing underneath. Uh, power lines are most likely going to be trimmed regularly or even to the side if they're close enough. Um, so you're gonna wanna consider that when planting trees. Typically, they recommend not planting any trees that are higher than 15 feet high um, underneath power lines. One of the best tools to use when selecting trees is Select Tree. This is um, put together by Matt Ritter and some of the, his colleagues from Cal Poly. 
This is a great way to choose trees by their characteristics. So please visit Select Tree and play around um, with the different search tools um, and get familiar with it because it's just such a valuable resource to have. There's different tree characteristics that need to be considered when choosing a tree. Um, so we talked about different horticultural uses, um, specimen, trees, screen, container, utility, shade. Um, you wanna know what the maximum height and width are gonna be at maturity, what kind of shape the tree might have. There's different um, tree shapes and all trees grow the same. Um, and so that might be something you wanna consider. Um, what type of foliage the tree has, whether it's evergreen, deciduous or semi-deciduous. Um, what the water use rating is. So if you're looking for something extremely drought tolerant, you might wanna look at something with a very low water use rating. What the root damage potential is, uh, what type of fruit and the amount of litter um, that the tree produces, what the flowering and fruiting season of the tree are, what different types of diseases or pests the tree is susceptible to, and you definitely want to um, know what the hardiness, the USDA hardiness zone or sunset climate zone for, uh, that the tree can thrive in is here in San Diego. We're typically nine USDA hardiness zone nine and climate zone, zone 24. Um, okay. When you're choosing your tree at the nursery, once you've selected which species you would like to plant. There are a couple things to consider. Um, you need to inspect it before you purchase. Not all trees are created equal at a nursery um, and you reserve the right to purchase the tree or rejected tree if it's being delivered if it doesn't meet your standards. So the crown and leaves, um, branches and trunk and roots shall be appropriate for the species, age and size of the tree and for the time of year. There should be no signs of prolonged moisture stress, um, so no wilted or shriveled leaves. You don't want any kind of dead or broken branches, anything that looks diseased, um, no wounds on the tree, conks, uh, mushrooms growing out of the soil, any kind of damage on the tree. Um, and then you wanna check underneath the nursery stake, which is usually the, the stake that's pre-existing on the tree to make sure that um, it's not girdling the trunk of the tree or causing damage on the tree. Okay, when you're looking at the crown of the tree, um, it should have a single relatively straight leader. There are certain cases that you might be interested in getting a, multi, a multi-stem tree, but in general, we want um, trees that are have one single leader. Okay, so no co-dominant stem, or any other vigorous upright branches that are competing with that single leader. Uh, main branches should be well distributed along the central leader to form a balanced crown. Okay. And then you also wanna make sure that you don't have included bark. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. This acute angle creates a situation where the bark starts to grow into the tree and can cause structural problems um, on the tree later in life. Um, want to make sure that the branch proportion is good so that you don't have a branch that's almost as big as the central leader and that they haven't lollipopped up the tree, which you see a lot at nurseries, but you actually do want branches that go almost to the bottom um, of your trunk. It's going to create a stronger, healthier trunk on that tree. Okay. The trunk caliper and taper should be sufficient so that the tree can remain vertical without a stake. So again, it should be able to stand up when you remove that nursery stake. Um, at six inches above the soil substrate, it should be between 0.75 and 1.5 inches. Okay, for, that's for a 15 gallon tree. And between 1.5 and 2.5 inches for a 24 inch box tree. The root collar and root ball shall be free of defects, including circling <coughs> kinked and stem girdling roots. So here we have an image of what that looks like. Which so, the equities for of a hundred. Um, roots on the bottom of the root ball shall be less than a fourth of an inch diameter. 
and uh, you want the tree to be well rooted in the substrate so that you actually have a nice root ball um, when you plant the tree. Yeah. Okay, before you plant um, your tree, you're gonna wanna contact DigAlert. Okay, and you can do that either by going to this link here or by calling 811 and uh, making a report. And um, they typically want you to mark the area that you're going to be planting so they could come out and um, physically see it. Um, and typically you do that with white, um, like a white survey paint or flag. Okay, and then when you're ready to plant your tree, you wanna check the root ball. And if you have issues with your root ball, you can correct, potentially correct them. Um, so gently till or lay the tree on the side, uh, being very careful not to damage the trunk or the branches and remove the container or the box from the root ball. And if you do have circling roots, carefully correct them. You can do this by gently pulling them apart with your fingers until they're pointing into a horizontal direction. You may need to carefully shave your root ball um, if you have a lot of matted or circling roots. Um, so you, you, get, you can see a nice example of these, all these roots are now going horizontal instead of are flat against the root ball circling the root ball here. Okay, and you can sever any roots that are circling or girdling the stem of the root collar. You don't want roots growing around the trunk of your tree that can cause failure later in life. Um, and always use sterile tools when you're pruning roots. I typically recommend using a 70 proof rubbing alcohol, um, spraying that on your tool between each cut. Planting holes should be two to three times the width of the root ball and no deeper than the depth of the root ball. Um, you probably want your root collar one to two inches above the soil. It typically will settle um, as you water in the soil um, in the tree well. So having it slightly above grade is always better than below. The sides of the hole or the slope, um, the sides of the hole should slope downwards. So it should be more narrow on the bottom than the top. And you should make sure that the sides of the hole aren't smooth. They should be scored up um, if in clay soils that can kind of create a, almost like a container itself where the tree roots can't penetrate those slick um, sides of the tree well. So you don't wanna loosen the soil at the bottom of the hole. You wanna make sure that that's firm. It's gonna help that tree from settling too far down. Um, it's really important to keep that root collar above the soil line. Okay. When you are excavating, um, typically I put like a piece of burlap or a tarp down and um, put all the soil that I'm digging out of the hole onto that to keep it separate. And then you can separate any large clumps of um, dirt or rocks out of the soil and use that for the berm. Uh, but you're going to want to use that soil when you backfill the tree. It's important to use native soil. And, um, go. and not add amendments to the hole because you want the tree to search for nutrients and water outside of the tree well. <clears throat> I typically fertilize um, from the top and around the tree well um, after the tree is done being planted. Carefully place the tree in the hole to check um, the, uh, the height and the placement is the way that you like it and make sure that root collar is above grade. If it's too deep, you can backfill using that native soil and make sure you tamp down that soil really well so that it's not gonna settle too much. Um, you can turn the tree so that any branches that, um, if you have like a walkway nearby, you can position the tree so that the current branches are growing um, in an area that they have room to grow and backfill the hole using native soil. Um, and, and if you have extra soil, you can use some of that at the top um, and then you can add mulch to it. Um, build a berm around the new tree so that it can hold water. Um, they should be four to six inches high and strong enough to hold a nice amount of water in there. Um, I like to use all those clumps and rocks to kind of reinforce that berm. And then I add mulch on top of the berm 
um, three to four inches of four inch mulch um, should be used. You should make sure that the mulch isn't touching the actual trunk of the tree because it can retain moisture and rot the, um, the stem of the tree or the root color. So down here, there's a nice image showing you don't want to create a volcano or a mound on your tree. You want to make sure that your root collar is exposed. Staking. Um, typically, we use a two stake system. Sometimes people use three, and that's even better. Um, but if you're using a two take stake system, it's important that you're putting the stakes on the prevailing wind side of the tree and opposite. So if you're prevailing wind in this image here, it's it's blowing to the left. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that one stake is on the prevailing wind side and the other stake is on the opposite. And then you band your trees with two bands, sometimes four, um, making sure that the bands are one on top of the other um, so that they're not pulling the tree in different places. If you have a band up here and a band down here, you might end up with an S curve in your trunk because um, you have two opposing forces. So it's important to put them close together. Um, you can put a second set down at the bottom. Okay, and then stakes typically go right outside the drip line of the tree, the edge of the berm. Okay. Um, young tree watering. So for the first three years after planting, um, it should, they should get one, uh, let's see, year, okay, in year one and two, they should get five gallons once time, once a week, <clears throat> year three, 10 gallons every two weeks or anytime the soil dries out or is hot, you should give the tree an extra five gallons. And you can measure that with a, five, a nice five gallon bucket. If you're gonna install irrigation to the tree, um, we recommend using an, a spiral of ip, drip irrigation and the instructions are listed here. And young tree pruning is really important to make sure that your tree is gonna have a, a nice structure um, and be healthy as it gets older. Um, each cut has the potential to change the growth of the tree. No branch should be removed without a reason. Most of the reasons that we prune young trees are to remove any dead or damaged branches uh, or anything infested and diseased um, and just to improve the form and structure. Pruning tools should be sharp and sterile and I usually use 70 percent proof um, rubbing alcohol. Okay. So here are some examples of what you may want to do. Remove limbs that extend beyond the natural crown. Uh, remove competing stems so that you don't get co-dominant stems in the tree. Shorten low branches to develop um, trunk thickness. Uh, remove suckers and sprouts that are growing up from the base of the tree. Try and when you're pruning, make sure you're making proper cuts and don't leave any stubs. Um, remove limbs that are turning inwards or crossing um, in the canopy. Making clean cuts and leaving no torn material or stubs is very important when you're pruning trees. This is a nice diagram showing how to properly um, cut a branch. Okay. Don't make flesh cuts. So you don't want to make a cut right against the tree trunk. You want to make sure you're making that cut on the outside of the tree uh, branch collar. And that's this line right here. The branch collar is this swollen bit right um, underneath the branch that connects it to the trunk. It also has a little ridge right here at the top. So when you make a cut, you want to really try and get right outside that ridge and the swollen bit of that trunk. Proper pruning is essential in developing a tree with a strong structure and is a desirable form. Trees that will receive the proper, <clears throat> appropriate pruning measures while they're young are going to require less uh, corrective pruning as they mature, which is going to save you money in the long run. So a good structure of primary branches should be established while the tree is young uh, when it's easy to prune the tree. Um, these limbs, scaffold branches, um, are a mature tree's framework. For most young trees, again, you want to maintain that single dominant leader growing upward. Uh, don't prune back the tip of that uh, leader or allow sec secondary branches to grow 
um, and definitely correct any structural issues that you're having with the tree while it's young so that when the tree is older, it doesn't create a hazard. If you do have mature trees in your yard, um, it's important to water them properly to maintain their health. So after three years, you're gonna wanna water deep and infrequently at the drip line of the tree. So don't water on the trunk. That's something um, that's pretty common, a common mistake that's made. Um, people will put the hose right on the trunk of the tree that can actually cause problems um, for the tree and most of the roots that are going to uptake water are going to be at the drip line or outside of the drip line. And you don't need to build a um, berm around your mature trees, um, but you can mulch them. Some common issues that we see on private property. Um, so there's definitely some issues when we have droughts a lot of time. Trees um, don't get considered when water gets turned off for drought reasons. <clears throat> so it's important that if you're turning off irrigation to your lawn and you have trees existing on your lawn that you're considering how you're going to water those trees throughout the drought. Even in the strictest drought restrictions, um, tree watering is still um, permitted and trees are going to um, help really prevent climate change and um, cool the area. They're valuable, they're expensive to replant. And so it's important to keep your trees alive. Grass and other types of vegetation can be easily replaced, but trees cannot. Um, so there's different methods that you can uh, employ when in drought. Okay. You can reduce your water use by 50% and by reducing your turf if, and planting trees. So um, with ground covers, porous pavers, you can collect rainwater, um, creating dry creek beds can be an attractive landscape alternative. Um, you're gonna wanna more water at dusk and dawn. Um, you wanna make sure that you're choosing the right trees that are drought, drought tolerant, putting them in the right place, um, trying to conserve and recycle water at home and mod uh, modifying your irrigation. We do have some pretty serious tree pests here in San Diego. Um, so you wanna consider what invasive insects you may have in your area. Um, and when you're choosing a tree, you, you need to know what kind of pests potentially can affect that tree. Um, so consider those pests and those um, and what host species they attack when selecting a tree from your property. If you're really interested in um, all the different types of pests and diseases your tree species can get, you can go here um, to this link and get a full list of all ailments that can affect your species. Um, and then information on each of these three pests, which are some of the biggest problems here in San Diego County, the shot hole borer, South American palm weevil, and golden, golden spotted oak borer can be found by clicking on the image of each of those. <clears throat> Topping trees. Um, don't, don't top trees. This is something that we see a lot on private property that most arborists can't stand <laughs> um, reasons not to top trees. You're starving the tree by reducing so much of its canopy, which is what feeds the tree, um, putting it into shock. You're attracting insects and diseases to the tree. You're creating um, a situation where you're gonna have weak limbs as they regrow. So you can see in this um, graphic here to the side, um, you're getting a lot of upright water sprouts on this tree and they're weakly attached. So they're more likely to break out than a properly pruned tree. Um, you can potentially even kill the tree. It's gonna create an ugly tree and it's actually just increasing the cost of uh, maintaining the tree because you're gonna need more pruning um, or correction um, of hazards for that tree. And then unqualified trimming near power lines um, can be a really big, very dangerous issue. Um, never prune trees near electric lines by yourself. It's required that a line um, clearance certified arborist 
prune trees, SDG and E um, um, has contractors that they pay to come trim trees um, underneath or around power lines for free. If you are concerned with um, trees growing into power lines, please give them a call. You can contact them at the number that's um, in bold here at the bottom. And they typically will come out and assess it within 24 hours um, or a few weeks of um, your call, depending on how severe the hazard is. Okay. If you touch an electric line with your, your own person or a tool or even touch a branch that's touching a, a electric line, you can get shocked or even die. So it's very important that um, you let the line clearance qualified arborists do that work. All right, and then trees should be considered during um, construction, but they really should be considered prior to construction during the planning phase. Um, typically a tree protection and removal plan should be made um, along with the construction plans if trees will be impacted um, during that construction. Uh, a tree protection zone should be erect erected around any trees that are to remain um, during construction so that they're not impacted. Um, a TPZ can typically be calculated by measuring the DBH or the diameter at breast height uh, of the tree um, and multiplying that by 1.2 feet. Um, and the DBH is measured at 4.5 feet above grade. Changing the grade um, or compromising the root structure of a tree can lead to failure in the future. So you may not even realize that uh, you've, you have a, a major issue with your tree until years after construction. And we've seen trees completely fail um, at the root structure um, from past construction. No heavy equipment should be used or stored within the TPZ and no chemicals or solvent should be used within the TPZ. Um, no fueling or anything should um, go on there. A certified arborist should be contacted for case-by-case -case specifics. And then tree hazards um, are an important thing to know how to identify. Um, if you need help, Identifying any hazards, you can always contact a certified arborist, but in general, you want to be able to identify um, previous failures um, or broken branches that are hanging up in the tree, um, any kind of sharp bends or your, uh, zigzags in your branches. Um, cavity nests, in a lot of cases, um, can remain, but if you have significant decay in the tree, that can be concerning. Um, if you have wounds, cracks, um, cankers, that's something that you may want to ask an arborist to come look at. If you see any mushrooms growing out of um, the tree, I would contact an arborist or any oozing. Um, you want to be able to tell if your tree has good structure or not. Okay. Um, and free trees. So there are a lot of places that you can get a free tree for your property, especially here in San Diego. The city of San Diego, if you're a resident of the city, you can um, apply for the free tree program. And then um, you have to sign a watering agreement, but the city will come and plant a tree in front of your house. Um, SDG &E and DV have a tree program as well. Um, SDG and &E removes a lot of trees underneath power lines, but they are always giving new trees and replacement of the trees that they take out and they can give you um, multiple trees um, in replacement of one tree. Kate Sessions um, is a program that has started out of our Urban Forest Council here and they have a free tree program um, as well. And the information is at the link that's listed here. Um, Tree San Diego has a program, a grant that they're uh, working on called Branched Out San Diego. That's for tree planting. Um, you can get free trees from the Arbor Day Foundation, the National Wildlife Federation, and there's always free trees at local Arbor Day events, which typically take place in spring and fall. There's lots of other free tree resources, um, lots of them on our website, the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council website. 
um, Trees Are Good website, which is um, funded by the California Urban Forest Council and the ISA, as well as other entities. And uh, the US Forest Service has put out a pretty nice tree owner, owner's manual, um, which covers a lot of different topics. If you're interested in purchasing a specific type of tree, there's um, several good local tree nurseries um, that we recommend are listed here. If you need a certified arborist, you can use the um, find an arborist search tool located on the Trees Are Good website to find an arborist in your area, or you can always email us at the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council's website. Um, we are a council of arborists. All right, does anyone have any questions? And um, please feel free everybody to jump in to answer that's on this call. Awesome. Uh, great job, Megan, first of all. That was awesome, very thorough, and I think very comprehensive. Um, yeah, is there any questions? Is there anybody uh, in attendance that, that has, some, has some questions? I know for me, one thing that was a little eye-opening was the, um, the zoning rules, uh, the fire code change stuff there, that canopy separation by 10 feet was something I think is uh, a pretty daunting task in the urban forest. How do you... Uh, I know there's, they're, they're trying to increase density in canopy coverage, and yet there's a requirement that's counter to that by having canopy separation by 10 feet. So I don't know um, if you have any thoughts on that one, Megan. Yeah, I think that is challenging. I know it's in a, I think that's really, you know, for areas that are in high fire risk um, zones and that have a lot of wilderness around them. So you can create a really nice fire break as opposed to being in a suburban area. But as we saw from some of those images, um, sometimes suburban areas burn too. And so I'm, I'm guessing those were created for areas that are forested. Um, so thinning out the trees, getting closer to your home if you're really living in a thick forested area. But I would wonder what Lynette uh, would say about that. Um, there, we do have a question, uh, somebody's basically asking, is there, how do you convince people to plant on private property? Do you have uh, bullet points? Do we have a bullet point series of how to convince folks to take trees on private property? I did not put bullet points together, but I suppose the first thing that you would want to do is kind of figure out what their limitations are, what their concerns are, um, right. and then you know, obviously going over any tree, tree benefits, right. the savings is a really big one. Um, but I, I would say having a conversation with that person to figure out what their concerns are, what the limitations are, and then trying to debunk those like we've done in this presentation um, probably would be the best route. Everyone ha seems to have different concerns um, about their trees or different uh functional goals for their trees. And so and, and, and I do think your your presentation basically takes every argument and gives you an answer, you know, in, in reference of defending, you know, to get them to, to convince because they're going to come up with rational reasons why they don't want to. And you have or not in their mind rational and you have a this PowerPoint basically is very comprehensive and for every issue that they might bring up, here's an answer. Right. Hiring professional arborists to make plans. So right. Always, Exactly. And I would say really going back to the conversation about tree selection and um, is really the most important. Tree selection and placement really can solve almost all of these issues as long as you're looking at planting new trees. Now, the issues with mature trees on private property that people have, that's a different story. We're not trying to, you know, we're not going to cut down all the existing trees out there because they're dropping a messy fruit or they're you know, doing, lifting a sidewalk. We don't necessarily remove a tree because it's lifting a sidewalk, but there are different mitigation techniques that we can employ for issues that we have with mature trees. I think, you know, this presentation really speaks to how to get people to take new trees and what to do with those new trees um, to grow the urban forest. 
Um, and we've had a couple really nice presentations lately about the mature trees um, and how to care for those. I will say, you know, I think some of the uh, negative connotations that some people may have about trees, it's from the wrong tree in the, in the wrong place. You know, they suffered for some reason because of a bad decision that it got to a mature state and became a problem. And then it just leaves a scar. Those people are like, oh man, trees are the wor worst thing I ever did was have this tree, you know, in my yard because of some bad choice that they didn't even know they made. So yeah, I think going back to the beginning, like you said, right tree in the right place is definitely a, a, good, uh, a, good, a good way to go. Uh, there's a comment about the watering. Did five gallons change? It used to be 15. Um, and there's a comment, uh, has to do with soil type, five to 10 gallons per inch of trunk diameter in sandy soils, less in clay soils. Yep. Wet soil doesn't mean it needs more water. So a little bit of variability there on, on how to water the trees, but mm -hmm. you know, just as a general five to 10 gallons is probably in line. Yeah, there's, uh, we do have a couple of really nice uh, diagrams on our website. I have the link there at the bottom for more information about tree watering. Didn't want to get into an entire presentation going on all the specifics, but right. wanted to touch on the generals there. No, and I think you did well. And I think, it, like I said, and it, taking any resident consideration of why they're going to say no to a tree, I think that that PowerPoint articulated a good reason against that that uh, advocates for the urban forest. So good job, Megan. I thought that was awesome. Uh, any other questions, comments? You can guys can, I think you can open your mic if you wanted to say something. Anybody else? So if we don't have any questions or comments, again, thank you, Megan, for an awesome presentation. Um, I think at this point, we're going to take about a 20-minute break. I know, uh, I think our original intent was to stop at 12, um, but we'll stop uh, here at 12.10, and maybe let's regroup at uh, 12.30. So if you all uh, go grab your lunch, go do whatever you got to do, and then we'll regroup and jump into the uh, business portion of the meeting at uh, 12.30. So I'll see you guys in a little bit. Mike. Yes. Oh, hi, Troy. Hi, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, just me or the whole, well, yeah, go. you're going to be on the whole group here. Okay, well, that's okay. Um, we're having issues with the, the San Diego Unified School District cutting down. Unfortunately, I saw your team out there yesterday cutting some large trees that probably could have been salvaged at the Hardy, um, no, not Hardy, um, Language Academy yesterday. Okay. And I got a call from a neighbor all upset about that. Okay. And they were just, there's just a big issue about the school district not really cherishing trees. They're just like easy to cut them down. They're un and it, it, is, it is, it is unfortunately the easy answer. And yeah, we definitely do our part to try and encourage and discourage uh, the removal of, of trees unnecessarily. Um, I don't, I don't know the detail of that specific school. I'm not, I don't do the day operations uh, anymore, but uh, you're, uh, I'll carry your message over to, to them and, uh, and share with them what you're saying. Well, I'm thinking, could we give this presentation to the school board? Because, sure. I mean, first of all, their list is very puny. Between the city's list and the school district's list, there's a lot that each of them don't want. Like the school district will not let you plant jack o at the school. Anyway, I'm having a real hard problem planting trees in the college area and uh, between the school districts and the um, and the city's list, it's, it's a, a bit of a problem. So anyway, yeah. and then also the business district, once again, you're in contact with the college area business district. I would love to give them a presentation for you guys to give a presentation to them. This very presentation would be good. Okay. Well, we can, uh, you and I, let's, let's chat offline and we'll, we'll follow up with each other. Okay. I'm good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's take a quick 20 minute break and we'll talk to you at uh, 1230. Vince, I don't know if you're on, but if you want to put on a timer, that's always fancy, but I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> otherwise, catch up with you guys at uh, 1230. Thank you. I'm going to turn off your cam my camera and my microphone. Mike, Mike, this is Ann Faggy. The other option is just to leave it on. And if people wanted to chat um, rather than, I mean, we can keep our own time, but when you put the timer on, yeah. we can't, can't chat. And there might be some, um, there might be yeah, some conversation right. over lunch. Fair enough. Great. I'm going to step out of it, though. So I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Ann. Hi, Troy. You're absolutely right. So, I mean, we need to give a presentation like this to the, you, the San Diego School Board and to the business districts. Um, 
Well, you know the old story. I, I'm still having a problem getting, giving away the trees in the college area. It's just crazy. You yeah. know, Troy, a follow-up. We, we talked about this. A follow-up to this really is a conversation. I think Megan gave, I, I'm super impressed, and I would like to see her very detailed slides, almost like a handbook. They're more than a presentation. You can't give this to the school board, but yeah. you can give something that gives some of those messages. This is almost like an addendum to that tree advocacy handbook because yeah. she's covered so many things here. And I can envision how we can we can make this almost like a, a more almost like a handout for, for San Diego. So so my mind is spinning. But what you're saying is that why do we care about trees is we've just got to have more common messages and we've got to get out there and we've got to, Megan was right about the answer at the end. What's their issue? What's the school district's issue? And then how do we bring them to comfort in those people that are making decisions, especially at the district level? You know, yeah. you've got to deal with each principal. It may be that we, and you know, in Virginia and, and um, Muriel King and some of those folks that have dealt with schools can easily say, these are the 10 questions and how do we address those? So I, you're absolutely on this. The school should be our example of where there are trees, not the exception or the opposition. Um, and so we, you're absolutely right. And, and well, I, I actually have had the place I've had success in getting the college area trees in is the, the school near me and the school, the two, the two schools here are the ones that are planting the trees. Um, are, are they, are they the trees. In, inside the schoolyard or along the street line? Along the street. That's along great. The, but there's yeah, yeah. every school. That's an easy place to get it. Right. You right. have to deal with the watering. Um, no, that's fine. But so our two of our schools are good, but my neighbor or some of our planning group, Julie Hamilton, who I think you know, she called me yesterday like they're chopping down these trees, which I had called the school, which was the language academy. I had called them and said, what's wrong with this? You can see that we're not watering these trees enough. Three old trees are probably 50 years old. And they just came and cut them down yesterday. And one person said, oh, they conflict with the water lines, one of the tree choppers. And one of them, one of them said, um, uh, oh, no, they had some kind of disease infestation. Oh, they just weren't water. They're not and healthy. They, they did, yeah, and they didn't even bother to tell the, the neighbors, which was, my friend lives like right next door to where it is. And she was just so pissed. And we were just like, we got to do something to educate the school district about the value of trees for students and the neighborhood and to contact neighbors if you're going to chop down a big old tree, you know? Well, Troy, I really Troy uh, was, was any of those trees impinging on the solar panels? Because Steve noticed that too, and he told me about it. But he thought it was because they had put solar panels in their parking lot and that somehow maybe these trees were deemed, whether rightly or wrongly, to be a problem for that. Well, they're behind the, um, they're on Casita and 64th. They're not, they're not actually where the ridiculous plastic turf is. <laughs> they're they're oh, not them, yeah. they're, uh, which is fine. They should put the solar panels right over that plastic turf. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they've got no businessman called back behind <laughs> what's that i am muted not. pardon mm -hmm. what's that robin uh oh, oh. Uh, uh, i think it was lynette maybe that was on audio okay um yeah, I we just yesterday we were so discouraged. Like, how are we going to start a campaign? Well, we we'd like to hit up the business district big time, and Mike Pallet's group works for them to educate them because we have a hard time. We got a lot of palms, not much shade, and um, so hitting those guys up. And right now, the thing is, how do we how do we get the school district right to our representative on the board, you know, do a presentation at the board, which it would be great for you guys that are, that are, have those 
Well, that's a public school, even though it's an emergent school. So, you know, well, it's, it's a charter school. But, it's yeah, still but the, the charters, that's a charter school. That's a public school, though. So, yeah. I mean, that, you know, they they still are under. I mean, I think in terms of a lot of things, they're treated as a public school, yeah. even if the there's there's issues. Yeah. Yeah, um, you still have to deal with the, the school board. Yeah, so, and uh, and I think that the this tree equity um, program that Anne's been working on simultaneously is going to be very effective because I think that's a school that's kind of in a, a neighborhood that encompasses quite a lot of diversity, and and it also brings people in like a magnet school. So. You know, there's a lot of reasons why that school is could be a test case, particularly since they have so much artificial turf that gets so Oh my hot. gosh, that turf is just ridiculous. We I mean, argued against it's a huge that area. When, yeah. they, when they were building that because the college area, the east part of the college area is has like on the on the county's heat energy or whatever, heat on, Yeah, it's high. Campus, it's, it's the highest, it's ridiculous. And then over here at Tubman, they were trying to put in artificial turf and I fought that tooth and nail because we're already roasting over here. But anyway. Well, so on the schools, Muriel has given it a single try. She found out that by going to a lot of meetings, they got more trees at the joint use ones. We need a small group of people that stays with it, that has a plan, that has messages, that has goals. Somebody's got to start that. If you start it and, and, and invite, you invite youth to come in with it, um, I think this would be an excellent um, piece for Youth for Climate Action, which is part of um, San Diego350.org. They are so impressive. Um, We've been um, doing learning journeys for middle school and high school kids, and I'll, th this resonates with kids. And so I, I think that if two or three of us just said, "Here's a, here's a, here's a skeleton, and here's how we how we invite um, collective um, voices and collective action," you can make a difference. But one of us at a time. Then we drop it. Then we go on vacation. Then I we do know, something else. <laughs> but but I think that if we make this, and we have all said schools is the place for the example. Schools is a place to reach your families. Schools is whatever. So and yet schools are so hard. So I think we need three or four of us to get this going. I had a quote from um, something I sometime in the last two weeks, and it was that. Um, that we need the wisdom of elders and the creativity and el energy of youth. Excellent. And so here's one where you get the Megan and the Troys and the and the um, Muriel Kings on schools, and then you invite youth to to say, "Wouldn't you like to have more yeah. shade in your schoolyard?" And they get it in in uh, you know a half a second. Well, we 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 were a few of us were just so curious. And we were like, yeah, we're going to do this. And so this presentation was perfect for something to bring to the school board. And I can look up their it's, menus. It's, it's, and it's too much. And you have to you have to have it focused. And you also have to have a plan. And and you have to you have to plan this campaign. And the school board is only one place. Oh, right. it's a very important place. But if you had 20 students or five environmental clubs or whatever the equivalent of, of bringing the the number of people working on it, you uh -huh. can make a big difference. So, you know, yeah. let's talk well, about a, a Muriel and, and others just, you know, let's have yeah. a meeting in, in a week or two and and um, maybe one of the 10, 10 a.m. On, on Friday mornings, we've been doing meeting about the Kate sessions, yeah. but this is a great I'm sorry one. I haven't joined you. What about, what about if schools was the focus a week from Friday? Uh, next Friday then? Yeah, a week from, yeah, in 10 days, not not this Friday. We already okay. have a focus. Let's do it. And then we can bring other people into that meeting. And okay. then um, in, in a very, very simple strategy, and I can, we can invite a few youth, um, kids that I know are interested in it, um, mm -hmm. to get it, just to get it started, just to see where it goes. 
Well, I, I'll ask the principal at, at our to meeting school to, to send somebody. Okay. Um, and and uh, or, or if they have some students that would be interested in that, that's the, the best way if we could. He's talking, I met him this morning and he's one Robin, Robin introduced him to our school and he's now working as the gardener, but he's been spread too thin. But he's going to start teaching the fruit orchard and have a garden club again, which he did, which he just got hired for, but they're going to help him out now. So thank you, Robin, if you're still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah, that'd be super. So I'll see if he can come. Well, it just, it just to get it, I mean, it's, it has to start and it has to be sustained, but if it doesn't have a collective plan, um, I know. We, we can't do anything with it. We simply can't. Okay, then veering, veering off into another direction. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know how Ralph's, we never got any payback for those guys. The place across the street who have been hacking away at their, the little shopping center at their carrot wood trees. That's what they had. And they've been keeping them shrubbed out. Anyway, a new person bought the shopping center and now they have pulled them all out. They have totally removed all the trees except one big one, thank goodness. And they're putting in little shrubby grass things about that high in the in the small medians they have. And I'm like, oh, you talking about the coffee shop, uh, Troy? It's the place where the, there's a juice bar, Sandy, and Moxie Theater. And, oh, uh, that and shopping they, center. Yeah, mm. I mean, they've been screwing their trees for a long time, but... Well, but remember their permit. It, remember, you know how hard it is to get a hold of the permit. It, exactly. The permits originally, when that shopping center was put in, just like Ralph's, it required trees to okay. have a certain amount of cover, and it required them to be maintained and replaced when they died. So we, again, we know that that's a requirement and there's a code enforcement issue, but if you, number one is you start with that. And then number two, you make it also, you know, a community campaign, which then educates the community about shade and cooling and climate change and what you can yeah. do individually. And that you get this, um, this owner to, you know, to, to buy the trees and, and, you know, it's not very much money. And, and, um, say the medians or the places to plan are about like that, nine inches wide. Then make sure that you put the right tree in the right place yeah. so that you don't get exactly. the other problem, which is right. that they're so big that they don't have anything else to do. No, but don't worry. They, the, those trees they planted were not a good idea. It was mostly carrot woods and those. Well, are then good. put in something that's going to fit that's going to not going to over yeah but so i think that the other I'll thing is that there's a group looking at a notion of a tree watch which is looking is which is paying attention to mature trees and whatever can be done for maintenance and protection preservation and oh. so i think that's another approach that we need to do collectively and so there's actually a need to have what do you do about topping? What do you about, do about parking lots? What do you do about code enforcement within this tree watch? And I think part of it is that that uh, we we need to catch more of this before the day the the chainsaws come. Exactly. Not, e not easy to do, but if we're not working on it at all, then right. we're going to see chainsaws all over the place. Yeah, and, and the tree watering. The, and the, I was trying to, because remember, we never did find the permit for Ralph's. I mean, they never, they said, oh, well, we can't get back there. I'm not sure if this was built before, it might have been built before Ralph's. So that's the problem is we don't have any paper trails on what they were supposed to do. And I remember that we went to the city attorney and she was going to do something, but I can't remember how we did it. It was so long ago. <laughs> no, the, 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 um, the issue there is that in in, um, in looking at our tree codes, um, Vince and um, Brian Widener and I looked at tree codes, looked at tree codes from six or eight other cities, made yeah. some suggestions on how tree code, street tree codes should be revised. And so that is sitting in the to-do box for the, um, for the city forester. And I don't think he's brought it to the city attorney, but, but I think they were, um, 
they were aware of it. And, and uh, one of the comments that she made was that there needs to be a fine system in the code so yeah. that they don't have to recalculate it every time. But yeah. there's another emphasis that's needed that simply doesn't happen unless you have some kind of a strategy and an organized, yeah. And in addition to that, you have the land, the land development code, which says new construction, what do you have to do, et cetera. And we've all worked on that one. And I think that 2020, we didn't get in anything except to get the palms were not to be planted anymore. That was that year's accomplishment. And we need to, to dig back in again and yes. either, you know, and, 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 and work with the land development code to make sure, because one, one thing that's happening is that you're, you're from every, every development is pulling out trees and building to the lot line. Yes. And that's not okay. That's another issue that we yes. have is the ADUs, the whole thing of being, letting everybody cram in as many things as possible with no requirements on any, can we not, can we not require at least a tree? The state of California does not have that. We can't be any more, what, what is it, restrictive than the state of California and they don't have that. I mean, that's ridiculous. We have our climate action plan. I was looking online to find this, the state's climate action plan to see, don't they advocate, don't they have one and don't they advocate for trees? And why would they have these ADUs that aren't required to in install a tree every time they build one instead of filling the whole lot with concrete and, and roofs? Yeah, <laughs> that's what we, also, we also have to trust that the attention that's, that we've gotten this summer to climate change being real, being here, um, heat events, um, the benefits of trees, we've got to use that to turn the public sentiment locally, yeah. and we've got to use it for people to, in their private spaces, to want to put trees in. I not know. everybody's doing infill, not everybody's doing ADU. There's lots of places that could still put in trees as a family backyard tree. Right, so right. And there's a little bit, yeah, so now, you know, in this whatever amount of time we've just covered how many topics? Well, I mean, we're spread really thin because I'm just like, you can go off in 50 directions of what we need to do. And especially me just getting rid of these hundred trees <laughs> that, yeah. that we're trying to give away. And uh, at least I got somebody to help me in the neighborhood now. So we should be able to get them all planted in November. But Can you um, send me an update on that, would you? Okay, I will. Okay. Anyway, thanks for the conversation. Nice to see you, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is super. Yeah. And, and how was your bike ride? You, look, you guys always have the best summers. Well, we bicycled from Chicago to Oklahoma City and had um, went through a lot of small towns. Missouri, we didn't see a single mask, so we weren't surprised to see what's happening right now with Missouri. But yeah, it was a great, we did Route 66 and it really was great. So I've been, been back for over a month. But it was great while I was out. So, was it hot? Oh uh, yeah, it was. We uh, we um we did not camp because there's not a, a lot of campgrounds along the way anyway. So my husband was quite relieved to pay for an air conditioned motel every night. But you know they were. I think we paid anywhere from fifty to seventy bucks most nights. So yeah, it was a very affordable, very planable. Um, lots of small town experiences it was great I thank you i love it i always start daydreaming when i see your lines about it i'm like i'm gonna do that <laughs> all right hi everybody um i want to jump back in from our little break there so uh again uh thank you megan for your presentations uh, there was some requests of uh making that presentation available i um we're going to try and get that posted on our social media and our websites. And I know, I think it was recorded as well. So we'll, uh, we'll get it posted and, and made available for, for everybody's use. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, so going into our agenda here, we have our business portion of the meeting, which we kind of go over a variety of topics. So uh, I'll start with the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council update. Um, we have an executive committee that meets. Uh, can monthly. you, can you take us off the, the agenda so we can have more of a conversation. I think it's a pretty basic. You can you can call on us and, and work through the agenda. Well, it helps people prepare. That's why I have it up. Yeah, and it helps people talk to each other if we have more than just four people in a in my box. 
for you. Anything for you, Adam, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Okay, hold on. Let me put it back up on my screen. Thanks. Can and I, I need to leave soon, but I did want to retouch base with, with you, Mike, again. Okay, let's, let's talk after or send me an email. I'll email, email you or, or something. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for this. Okay, sounds good. All right, so um, San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council, we met uh, as an executive committee uh, prior to this meeting, uh, discussed a variety of things, including um, our next meeting. We briefly discussed the drought issues that are happening. I was up in uh, Northern California uh, earlier um, in July, and uh, it was pretty incredible for me to see the how low the water is uh, in Northern California, which is a pretty big indication of what's headed our way. Um, so, and I know Delia also mentioned she had seen some stuff as well. And I know there's been some big, big research on seeing where the reservoirs are and just everything is really, really low. I don't hear it on the media being promoted that we're in a drought, but it's coming whether we like it or not. So I believe our next meeting is gonna be heavily focused on messaging associated with keeping our urban forest thriving in these drought restrictive times. Cause I think it's gonna be heading our way shortly. I'm not sure why it's not being publicly announced yet, but um, that's something we did talk about. We also talked about uh, supporting Arbor Days a little bit better. We're going to use some of our funds to um, give a little bit of a stipend to folks to represent us at different uh, regional, represent the Regional Forest Council at different uh, tree planting events. So in March of next year, March 12th, 2022, there's going to be a big tree planting event uh, here in San Diego County that uh, we're going to be looking for support on. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that kind of covers that. Um, Megan, if you're there, could you tell us what's going on with California Urban Forest Council? Uh, Megan sits as our, uh, she's on the board of directors for California Urban Forest Council. Hey, Mike. Um, we did get some good news that our urban forestry bill was passed. Let me see if I can pull up that specific information real quick. Okay, so it's SB 347 and it's the California Community and Neighborhood Tree Fund. And it was passed, let's see, on July 19th. So that was really exciting for us. That was something that we were advocating for uh, with Senator Cab Valero. And it's basically going, and I'm not ex exactly sure how all these taxes work, but it basically allows individuals to allocate their taxes after a certain threshold to go into this tree fund. Pretty cool. Yeah, I think on your tax bill, you're going to get an option of saying, do I want to donate towards California's urban forests or something along those lines. But yeah, no, I'm pretty excited about that. That was a big win for us. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we're striving for. So pretty good news out of the Urban Forest Council. Awesome. Um, I, I think, isn't there a conference coming up too, Megan? Are you aware of that one? I think it's going to be virtual, but is there something um, that Nancy has announced on that front? Um, I haven't heard anything about that okay. yet. Okay. It's coming. There, there, I believe there's something happening, I think, in October, but I think there'll be some announcements coming out about that here shortly. Right. It looks like there's also a grant uh, opportunity out, the California Outdoor Equity Grant Program. Um, she sent some information out. It's from the U.S. Forest Service. So if anyone's looking for grants, you might want to check that out. It looks like there's awesome. $57 million available. Wow, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, cool. A a anything else? That's all right now. All right, very cool. Well, thank you, Megan. Um, so I, I, again, uh, when we say caufc.org is the website, if you guys are interested in some of the things Megan's talking about, and uh, there's a lot of initiatives and activities going on with that organization. So um, with that, I'm going to move to our next uh, person on the agenda, Lynette, um, Lynette from Cal Fire. She's our local urban forester from Cal Fire. Lynette, could you give us an update on what's, uh, what's happening with Cal Fire? Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, sound check. You guys hear me okay? My audio is yep. a little different. Okay, good. You're, good. You're golden. Yeah, so um, I always try and get ahead and see where I was with my last update. And I think um, we were in our open for our grant program. We were in the open proposal uh, stage or we were about to release um, either way. So that, that time has passed. We collected all of uh, our concept proposals, which is the first phase of, of applications for our grant program for this uh, cycle in which we currently have uh, just over 10 million of CAL FIRE Urban and Community Forestry's general fund allocated uh, towards the grant program. And now that the, um, we're past the, the fiscal year mark, we're definitely anticipating another 13 and a half million or so. So somewhere around uh, just over 20 million to apply to uh, uh, grant projects for this next uh, cycle. Um, <clears throat> that ha that 13 and a half million hasn't definitely been allocated yet, but I just heard yesterday that it's, it's more than likely going to, and that's kind of what we were anticipating anyway. So, um, but that being said, so this year, just to, to recap, we, um, put three different programs out. One is brand new. So, um, our first program, urban forest expansion and improvement, that's kind of our urban greening tree planting, um, type program. And we had 29 um, project proposals for that category. Um, another, another program or category that we've had in the past is earth, urban forest management activities, which is um, the local governments are only eligible for that program, but it's basically for either the initiation, creation, or update of an urban forest management plan or uh, the urban forest uh, component of a, of a city's general plan or establishment or update of their, um, their, their street tree inventory or their comprehensive city inventory. Those types of activities um, are what land within that, that uh, category. Anyways, we had 25 proposals uh, total from that category, totaling uh, somewhere around uh, $17,000 um, in request funding. Let me go back real quick. So uh, urban forest uh, expansion and improvement, the, the, the first program that I mentioned, um, our total request for that category was uh, just over 33,000. And then the third category, which was a new uh, program this year that we named Urban Forest Education and Workforce Development, which was pretty exciting, um, putting that out there. We had 20 total proposals, uh, totaling 27,000, just over 27,000 um, in, re in request funding. So a grand total of 74 27 million. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I meant to say million. I'm sitting here looking at really small numbers and I don't want to, I'm trying to look at, the, at, at this. <laughs> I'm looking at two different screens right now. Sorry. 33 million for urban forest uh, expansion and improvement. 27 million in request funding for uh, education and workforce development and just over almost 17 million. Sorry in uh, management activities, totaling 74 proposals, which is, uh, we've had more proposals in the past, but we've also had grant cycles where we had uh, fewer. Um, so I don't think our available funding really ever affects how, uh, how many proposals and interest we get in our grant program. Uh, but the grant uh, funding request total is, uh, it's below 100 uh, million this year. It's 77, um, million or so, which is obviously a lot more than we can fund. So if we uh, receive the additional 13 and a half million, we'll have um, somewhere just over 20 million statewide to allocate. So obviously we have far more uh, requests uh, than we can fund. Um, so we've got to really diligently uh, get rating these proposals. So right now that's where we're at. We're, we're in the phase of we're rating proposals um, we have very lofty, ambitious goals to have that done pretty soon. Um, but even as, as quick as we get these proposals rated, we're going to wait until that additional funding is definitely allocated to the program. So uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our program, we will, <clears throat> we will qualify um, probably twice as many uh, applicants than, than we can actually, or proposals than we can actually fund. 
we uh, notify the applicants and we ask them to now submit a full proposal. And that's where we <clears throat> will rate them again. And we'll have to weed out, um, you know, basically who are at, who are at the top notch um, ones that are going to be funded for the for the cycle. Uh, the question I usually get is is how much funding we're going to allocate to each um, to each category, and and we're going to base we don't we don't predetermine that we just base that on the quality of pr proposals, the uh, funding request amount, and everything. So we still that's still yet to be determined, but we're gonna we're gonna even it out. Um, I think given that this, this could be a, a one-time deal where we're funding uh, the education and workforce development um, program. The reason I say that is right now, it's, uh, this is, these are general funds. If let's say for example, next grant cycle, next year or cycle, um, if we're solely funded out of uh, California climate investment funds, there's a lot more strings attached to that funding and we wouldn't be able to fund projects like education and workforce development. So we may put a, a heavier emphasis on, on that program. In other words, allocate a, a little bit more funding. We also really wanna look at the quality of the of the proposals and see if it's the type of activity that we're really looking for. Um, we don't really have any specific um, uh, desires for what we're looking for for that program. We kind of wanted to see, uh, we want to get an idea of the interest and the need out there from the field and go from there. So that's um, going to take a little bit longer uh, this go round. That being said, um, our projected date, we don't have a projected date, but uh, we're probably going to ask or notify all applicants, whether successful or not, whether we want to collect a full application from them. Probably not until, um, I would say, when did we say? It's going to be like September. Altogether, time frame wise, um, we're hoping to be able to have full applications um, by the end of the calendar year. And that puts us at the beginning of 2022, um, entering into agreements. And so projects would in theory be able to start in the spring of 2022. Um, and I just asked this yesterday, we don't have a projected uh, expiration date for, for these grants. Uh, I know that it'll go past the spring of 2024. So these projects are going to have at least a few years to, uh, to execute their projects, which is usually, the, usually about the time frame that we have. Um, so those are, those are the metrics that we collected um, on the grant programs for this year. Um, a lot of repeat uh, applicants, cities, um, but also a lot of new uh, organizations coming online. I think that's just with the with our new workforce development education program that we offer. So I myself haven't delved into the uh, proposals yet. I'm looking forward to that category. Um, and so I'd say by the time we, when's our next, uh, when's our next meeting, Mike? Regional Council? It is October 6th. We will October probably, 6th. we will definitely by then have asked back um, uh, for full proposals, but we won't have selections yet. We won't have selections until the, the end of the calendar year. So it'll be two more, two more programs, but I'll have a, a, maybe, maybe a little bit of an update. Maybe we'll receive a little bit more funding. There was a little bit of talk of um, a certain uh, program within CAL FIRE um, who, was, who were allocated quite a bit of funding um, and aren't going to be able to encumber it in time. So uh, the next down on the list, I guess, was urban forestry. So we may actually receive uh, a, a large influx of funding, um, but to my knowledge, it's not going to be something that we can apply to this grant cycle because by the time we would be allocated that funding, it would be for the next grant cycle. But hopeful as we are, um, our next grant cycle could be very large. And I'm saying somewhere around um, $200 million or so. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's hopeful, huge. But that, that's the number that's being thrown around. Um, and that's far more than we've ever been able to handle. So that being said, <laughs> with our small <laughs> with our small staff um, that we have, we have six regional urban foresters spread out. We have a, a supervisor down here in the south, new new position, James Scheid from from the north, uh, supervising us regional foresters in the south, and uh, Walter Passmore, uh, newly appointed uh, state urban forester program manager from the city of Palo Alto. 
Um, we're in good hands. We're going in a good direction, but we would definitely have to uh, allocate some of those funds towards uh, hiring new positions and um, expanding our uh, our reach a little bit. Um, and a lot of people will ask, well, will you increase the um, the maximum award amount? So it's per you know grant project, likely. But I don't I don't ever see us having you know. Uh, five million dollar uh, projects because simply because that those type those scale of projects take a long period of time and for whatever reason we just can't get past that three or three and a half year mark before those funds expire so these have to be manageable projects that um, you know a, a average size city can accomplish um, in in that period of time so uh, it's going to just it's going to be us needing to uh, augment our staff so that we can handle more uh, more contracts. But each of us just just I don't know out of context. Each of us regional foresters manage anywhere from thirteen. I, I have seventeen open grant projects right now, and we'll be taking on a few more. So um, it's it, it they're they're quite a bit to stay on top of. Um, anyways, that's what's on the horizon for us. Um, I think I think our program is sitting very. Uh, in a very positive uh, position politically. Uh, we have the backing of the CAL FIRE director. Um, he's always advocating for our program. He actually, he is a forester. He's a registered professional forester. He came from forestry ranks. Um, so we've always had his support and backing. And then we have a governor who's uh, in line with, um, you know, urban forestry. He's at least aware of, of um, urban forestry and, and the positive effects. So we're, we're all slowly getting there, but I, I think that our program is pretty, pretty secure and we're gonna be able to maintain some level of funding to have a grant program every year. So that's Very a grant cool. update. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a lot of exciting things. And uh, yeah, I, uh, Walter's a good guy. Um, I've known Walter for quite some time and I think he's a, he's a good fit for your program. And I think he's going to bring some awesome stuff uh, to the state with uh, his knowledge and experience. So, yep. pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, any questions for Lynette? Guess not. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Lynette. Appreciate the update. Yep. You rock. All right. Next one up is um, I'd like to have uh, Tree San Diego. Um, Electra, are you uh, are you there, Electra? Yep, I'm here. There you go. So uh, I'd like to. I don't know if everybody knows Electra, but Electra was uh, recently appointed the director position for Tree San Diego, and uh, I welcome I welcome her to this to this group uh, to give a little bit of an update on what's happening with Tree San Diego. And and uh, yeah, why don't you tell us what's happening with Tree San Diego? We got some curious group curious people on this particular meeting, so. Yeah, put What's on the spot. Mean? Definitely. Um, brief <laughs> update on Branch Out San Diego. So this is a CAL FIRE um, a grant and project that we are moving and grooving on pretty quickly here. We're hoping to reach our 50% uh, planting rate within, I think, 11 months of the first kind of um, implementation of this. It's almost 1,600 trees. Um, it's primarily on residential land. So um, that's in, in line with the earlier presentation today. Um, we've seen some of the similar um, limitations that, that the city has seen, but we're learning uh, that there's a lot of creative opportunity out there to, to work one-on-one -on -one with residents. We've paired uh, residential tree planting with our tree steward um, training. So it's it's a opt-in if folks want to do that, they can do that without any any um, charge to them. They can meet one-on-one -on -one with our arborists and learn about trees and, and uh, benefit from that. They've also been encouraged to utilize our tree plotter software to see where those trees are planted throughout the grant and whole grant cycle and beyond if they'd like. Um, We've got other projects in the work too. We'll be working with a couple cities to uh, kind of do like the match.com of tree planting where we've got some funding that is coming in from private donors that they'd like to see trees go directly, get, get those direct benefits to residents and communities um, countywide. So they wanna see things happening quicker um, and, and just kind of bypass some of the red tape that we experience in the field. So we're working directly with the cities to match those funding efforts with 
residents and businesses um, throughout the county. We're also looking to expand a lot of this kind of influence up into North County because I think a lot of the focus is going into disadvantaged communities right now. We've got some low income communities on the east side and North County that really need some extra love. So we'll be um, targeting those areas and then uh, really, really doubling down on the urban forestry education component. And I see we've got Tim and Kurt on the line here. They're going to be spearheading some of our work in the field and working directly with, with residents and community groups that speak to, to tree inequity and, and how we can approach that better with, with council members and leadership. So lots going on. Um, we're looking forward to, to the fall planting season and we'll be out with the uh, tribal lands out at San Pascual Reservation, um, distributing about 400 trees. Um, yeah, hopefully in October. So that's our update. Lots of stuff. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out, check out branchoutsandiego.org if you want to know more about the project. Yes, very cool. A lot of exciting stuff. And uh, yeah, just gr grateful to have you uh, spearheading at Electra and just uh, exciting things happening with Tree San Diego. So any questions for Tree San Diego? No? Thanks. Okay. Thanks for having me, Mike. I, I know, Kurt, I... I <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know Kurt. I see you're there. Maybe you know you're the you, you play the arborist role. You want any? Uh, you want to say anything on your behalf of uh, what you're seeing in the urban forest, real quick? Well, yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> if you look around out there, you can all I can already see um, some dieback in a lot of eucalyptus from just the beginnings of the new drought cycle. And if anybody else has noticed that, just relatively healthy trees, just pockets everywhere on big trees where they're shutting down. And it didn't, at least to this point, uh, traceable to an insect or otherwise. So I just got to remind everybody to, you know, all my clients as a private consultant, deep water your trees in the summer, they kind of get forgotten. And especially with only four inches of rainfall from Mother Nature this year, um, that's going to be a continuing thing. Um, our tree steward program, we're doing really well. That's expanded. We're doing it on average bi-monthly now. And we used to do it much more sporadically when, when need arose. So it's nice to have that grow. And it's been great to have Chuck Morgan join us at Tree San Diego and uh, enjoy working with him a lot. And yeah, we're looking forward to getting our hands dirty again with uh, some of our interns besides doing canvassing and community outreach. Hopefully this fall we'll be able to you know, get some more trees in the ground at some more planting events, which is something we've dearly missed for the last 16 months, you know, kind of go through withdrawal. Why are we not planting? <laughs> it's hard to do, but, you know, COVID did what it did, but we got a lot of good things going on. And then my grant that actually officially ended almost two years ago, Tree Advantage, we have some funds left. We're going to be remulching a bunch of the city trees uh, in Logan Heights and Chula Vista to get Urban Corps to, uh, you know, give them a big blanket of mulch to see if we can get them to, you know, get over that next leg of uh, that, you know, young tree phase, they're between three and five years old now. Most are stabilized, but we could still use more people watering. And it's just one of those things you can see trees in a neighborhood where someone's obviously not watering and someone is, and the difference is huge. Growth, sometimes 50% different in, in just the last two years, as far as that goes. So anyway, looking forward to lots more fun stuff. We've been on a little break here for the summer. It's been so hot and uh, we'll get ramped up and ready for the fall. Awesome, very cool. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the update. Um, I'd like to see if uh, anybody from San Diego Gas and Electric would like to give an update. Um, let me see if there's anybody. Jimmy Lee, Jimmy, you wanna? Can you give us an update? What's happening at SDG and E? Maybe Jimmy's not there. There he is. Is he jumping on? All right. Am I there? All right. Oh, there you go, Jimmy. Hey, did, what's happening, good buddy? To see you, folks. Yeah, it's um, yeah, we're we're doing great, having having a good time planting trees. So, um, it, it, just in case you haven't received or heard of the update from uh, Sempra's sustainability program that we have initiated a as a part of our program, a ten thousand tree. Uh, planting and or giveaways. And so we started the program a little bit late. We, we were hope, hopefully going to start in January, but we really got rolling in March. And a, a shout out to Nathan, who's on the call as well, who 
uh, who's been a, a great partner, him and Vince, that really helped support uh, this initiative. And so really the premise is that uh, we want to try to uh, get 10,000 trees annually into San Diego County. And so we've been reaching out to tribal communities. We've been reaching out to conservancies. We've been reaching out to private customers and you know private homeowners, uh, municipalities. And so everybody that is, is a, a big player within our industry, you know, we've been reaching out to them and it's been so far pretty successful. We're at about 6,000 trees. And uh, just because the, the, the program is, is fairly early in its, in its course, you know, we're, we're, we're counting almost everything, right? We're counting shrubs. You know, if we give you seeds, we're calling them trees, not really, but it's almost that bad. But uh, at some point as the program, it continues to mature, uh, Nathan and I have a, a, an approach. It's, it's, one, it's not one size fits all. We really take the time to meet with the various groups. Uh, for example, we met with uh, the Dixon, uh, the, the city of Escondido and Dixon Lake, and also the, the daily ranch people. And so in some instances, we're planting natives in a native habitat. We're also working with them to possibly harvest some of the uh, acorns because they've got some really good trees that are producing acorns up on daily. And then we're, we're reutilizing that back into the, into our communities, into that back areas. But in other areas, we're working with uh, homeowners that have had uh, devastation, the people from the Valley Fire that had uh, a bunch of trees burnt up. We've been able to help reforest and get uh, hundreds of trees back into those areas. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that's important to remember is that you know, it is a discretionary program, and I know there's been a lot of agencies, a lot of people are catching wind of this, and they're going, get your free trees, but really, we're trying to, uh, you know, be mindful, right? We want to really target underserved areas as much as possible. We want to plant in areas where there's a lot of value. One of the projects that we're hoping to to get off the ground is the Manzanita tribe uh, out in the Easter County up in Campo area. Uh, they they they're wanting hundreds of of native species there. And back in the 20s, there was a pinyon pine forest that was burnt up in the in a fire. And so we're looking to partner long term to help reforest that pinyon pine uh, ridge that literally goes all the way to Mexico. So you know we're in for the long haul. SDG &E is a you know as I think as Mike has said so many times, you know we're a, we're a big partner in this in this deal. And we're continuing to utilize this as an opportunity to communicate right tree, right place. And the big, the big key to that is that in some instances, when we're working with municipalities, we're able to get problematic trees out from underneath wires. Let's get the right trees in. But then we're also reaching out to the, the people that live adjacent too. So we're, we're working, and I think to Megan's uh, part, and, and great job on your presentation, Megan that uh, we're, we're actually working to plant in the front end and the back. So we've, we've got a kind of a motto that, that we've adopted, right? We want to do something now and we want to do something later and we want to plant in the front and we want to plant in the back. So everywhere we can, we can get those trees in the ground, we're going to do it. We're in the process of developing a website that will really communicate a little bit more clearly and at some point then we can let people know this is the messaging, this is really what the program is about, this is how it works. And then, wondering why, I was wondering why you couldn't see me, I had my little, my little flap shut. So uh, the other part of that is going to be um, uh, how-to videos, how to plant, how to water, how to prune, maintenance type videos, as well as uh, feedback. We want people to be able to post kind of a, vic I call it a victory lap. It's like, hey, we planted these trees. It was super successful. This is what it looks like a year from now. This is what it looks like two years, two years later. And then uh, all of this is remember that it, the umbrella, overarching umbrella is about sustainability. And so this is just one component of our sustainability program. Part of it is what West Coast Arborist is already involved in, uh, wood and managing wood, sustainable wood as well as uh, making sure that nothing goes to landfills that we're properly recycling and, and trying to go as, as electric as possible. And so um, at, at some point, 
uh, the, the, the website will communicate all of this information, but what we, we want to do as well is just because we want to make sure that what we're doing has a level of efficacy. We're using a Davy program right now that actually gives us the ability to plot where we're putting trees in the county. And so geographically, we can see that we're really moving the, the love. It's not just one concentrated area. And so uh, as, as we progress, we'll, we'll, we will want to work with the city of San Diego to overlay some of their underserved areas and areas of concern as it relates to vegetation. And then our, our QA team, we're going to actually cycle them through. And one of the, the communications that we want to have with our customers is that, hey, you know what, give us six months to a year. We may be get, uh, knocking on your door calling. We'd like to come and see, take a photo and really document how well the, the trees are doing and how uh, much canopy that we're developing. Because honestly, we could do a whole bunch of work and if we're not careful, it, it just goes by the wayside. So anyway, I, I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll digress. But yeah, that's, that's the newest, coolest thing I think we're doing. I love it, man. It's pretty awesome. And uh, I appreciate your guys' contribution back towards enhancing the urban canopy like that. You know, I was just thinking when you said 10,000, so it's 10,000 a year, it just because I have this frame of reference. So you guys are planting more trees in one year than exist in the combination of Lemon Groves, Del Mars, and Solana Beach's city's tree inventories. So, so one of the planting the yeah. three cities in the county in one no, year. I know. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. And we're excited. We're, we're, we're super excited about it. And so one of the things that we're actually doing is, is we're meeting and our community relations people are connecting us with the various communities. And so we've already met with La Mesa. And the, one of the, the problems that communities are, are ending up is they don't have enough right of way spaces in order to reach their climate action plans. So we, we're, we're uh, forming a, a, a team and a plan that we're actually going to go into an area that La Mesa will designate and then we'll we'll blitz all of the neighborhood, and we'll the goal will be to add three to five hundred trees in the front and in the back, or, or wherever they have on their properties, so that we can extend the canopy in in La Mesa in order to uh, to be able to help them achieve their climate action goals. And then the last part of it is um, awesome. I, I appreciate a sh shout out to uh, Vince. Thanks for uh, nominating me. I'm. I'm one of the new CUFAC members, and so I'm on the board. So I'll be representing wow. utilities for, for my term anyway. Very cool. That's a good position for you, buddy. I appreciate you representing it like that. So awesome. Any questions for SDG? &E? Really appreciate you being here, man. And yeah, cool. um, when you work with homeowners, um, is there a minimum? I have three questions. A minimum number of trees if a homeowner contacted you. Second question is, do you actually go into backyards or is it more just front yards? And then actually, would you bring and plant a tree as one of your strategies? So that, those are great questions. And so just to reiterate, you know, we try not to be one size fits all. And so we, we, we go site by site. And in some instances, uh, if, 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 there's, if it's high value, you know, we've given... Uh, 50 trees we've given hundreds of trees to, to to specific homeowners and part of it is uh do they have the the bandwidth to to keep the commitment to take care of those trees and so we go out and we see yes they have fixed irrigation you can see where they're going to put the trees and the infrastructure is already in place then we'll we'll release the trees in some instances depending on really our level of of interest in doing the extra we may, we may add irrigation, we may uh, do some of the heavier lifting in order to facilitate, but it's really a case by case. And, you know, Nathan's doing a great job of really keeping, keeping us moving forward. But I think for, for the, mo the most part, and this is the kind of the exciting part, and I know the concern about getting trees, not in right of ways, but in people's properties. I think that the low hanging fruit is really connecting with people that are motivated to receive the trees because they're going to take them, they're going to plant them. And for the most part, the people we've been giving trees to are doing the plantings themselves and they're managing and they're maintaining them. And we're, we're kind of validating that. So uh, I think at some point, you know, that you lose that low hanging fruit and then you go to areas where now, as Megan, you know, spoke of, you got to talk about 
uh, how can we convince people that, that there, there's a real value in receiving the trees? Thank you. Awesome. Again, thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate that. Um, with that, um, Anne, want to give us an update what's going on with the K Sessions initiative? Yeah. So um, real quick, um, the first thing I want to say is that there's a new tree equity map nationally. Um, and I'm going to put the, um, the links in the chat. Basically, we can you can look at um, parcel level and um, and the uh, census block for um, for the um, for the both uh, tree equity score map and a U.S. tree map, and you can look at an example uh, for Providence, Rhode Island. Um, the tree equity score combines socioeconomic status, health and climate factors, and tree cover. Um, last Friday, um, to the city of San Diego and a few others, I put together a presentation, kind of a tour, and I just recorded it. And there's the link to take the 13-minute tour of this. Um, it's kind of nerd based. It's like you got to, this is walking through it. It's not the short version, uh, but it's basically to, um, to let people know what's available for a subscription. Um, and I've been working with the city of San Diego to draft a request for quote. The other one is we need to get to, to the county to see if the county can assemble it so that a second subscription could be available for the rest of the cities and then the unincorporated urban areas so that, um, so that everyone would have access to this. It's quite impressive. Um, about Kate Sessions commitment itself, um, we're starting to look at something called a tree ambassador program with, with organizations and youth that would help us with some of this outreach that we um, all wanna be doing. Um, we would like to make sure that we have a good list of tree programs on the website. Um, and Megan has uh, put a lot of those in her presentation. I think her presentation is just an outstanding tutorial on all of the issues that we might be talking about. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that um, and, and, and learning from that. Uh, we're gonna continue accepting donations for, um, for people that, can't afford a tree right now, but would want to go in the front or backyards. Obviously, if there's other programs around, we will refer them to that. But but there's some who would just want to want to do it in a very informal basis. We probably have some kind of a short education commitment. Like we all know, if you don't really know how to get and grow a tree and aren't motivated, uh, the tree will be dead in a very short amount of time. Um, the watering is something we talked about at the 10 o'clock meeting. And I said I would be interested in inviting a small group to maybe just do a, maybe a two meetings on what kind of outreach we can do locally. The resources, the materials are absolutely amazing. Cal Relief has a great um, frequently asked questions, but we're just not getting it out to people here in San Diego. So if you're interested in um, two meetings on watering, if you can put your name in the chat, that would be great. I'm going to close on with Dahlia um, inviting her to give an update on working with Walter Anderson and other local nurseries to make sure that we have trees for people to purchase, small trees for people to purchase that'll all be launched um, after Kate Sessions' birthday on November 8th. But um, Dahlia's been working with the nurseries. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, we had a real successful uh, relationship in collaboration with uh, Walter Anderson, San Diego, uh, the Heinz Nursery in conjunction with the Village Nurseries and even Mission Hills Nursery and City Farmers Nursery. And uh, it's, it was real successful as far as people really wanting these trees. And um, we had the donations as Ann said, so these people were able to pick up a tree at Walter Anderson's and choose a tree they wanted. So we're trying to uh, improve our program, uh, going back to these nurseries, finding out what worked, what didn't work, how can we improve our, our communication and get this information out. So we'll be doing that in the next month or so, ready for fall. Thank you. Great work. Awesome, great job, you guys. Yeah. Uh, great program and um, yeah, keep on keeping on. And uh, I think we have a consistent theme that Megan's presentation, uh, the points of it are um, important um, to really get uh, 
get these trees into these properties that are otherwise uh, not that available. So very cool. So thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, with that, uh, let me look at the agenda again. Um, at this point, um, it's kind of open opportunity for other folks to share uh, what's going on with their projects or anything that they're up to that's related to urban forestry. So um, I see some names. I could call some names out. Um, they haven't hung up yet. How about Eric Cast? Eric, you there? Eric? Erich? I should say Erich Cast. He said he doesn't have his oh, microphone he... on today. <laughs> but, uh, but we're, yeah, we're working on lots of tree trimming. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, how about Annette? Annette, you want to give us an update what's happening in Antonidas? Hey. Um, not a whole lot to update. Just, you know, very busy dealing with summer. Um, and on a positive note, we did get our budget increased and brought back to how it was. I don't know how other cities were faring with that, but that's a positive note um, for us. So hopefully other cities experience the same in regards to trees and parks and all that. Will you be having an Arbor Day this year? We are planning on having, we're planning on having one as long as, you know, we're able to. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Hey, I um, uh, and now you want to talk about your new hires? Sure. Yeah, we've got um, two new Park and Beach supervisors. Um, Ed Drobnicki came from San Diego. I'm sure you, some of you know him, so he's here now. Yeah. Good for me. And then also Brian Sandlin came from um, City of San Marcos. And he's going to be working on his Arbor certification. So I'll probably connect him with you, Mike, on training and all of that. So they've been here about two weeks. So they're doing great and great for us. We really need the help. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, congratulations on two good people. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mike. Um, yes. One quick thing, just at, speaking of Arborist exams, anybody knows we're holding a special one in San Diego on September the 11th. Um, this weekend, I go to Los Angeles my third time this summer to give another ISA exam. So we've done three in Azusa this summer. September 11th, they'll be here at the usual place, uh, San Carlos Rec. And then we will go back next year to our traditional May second or third weekend. We'll have that back in regular, just so people can you know, plan and schedule for taking the test. Hey, hey Kurt, as, as the, I, I did the proctoring many, many years ago, and I know you've, you've taken it on. I just want to thank you, man, because without you, these exams would not be happening. I, I don't know if everybody realizes, but, you know, Kurt's a certified proctor to give the Ar Arborist exam. And really, he's the only one in the region. And he's really stepped up in a great way for really the whole industry. So, Kurt, really appreciate what you're doing. And just thank you for facilitating these exams. Without you, there's a lot of people who not be getting certified. So I don't know if yeah. everybody realizes that, but I, but I do. I realize that. So just thanks, thank man. I, I appreciate the shout out. I just balked at going to Bakersfield. I said, no, that's too damn far. So hopefully <laughs> this weekend I will be training the LA area proctor candidate. He's going to assist me. So hopefully LA will get back to normal exams starting next year. There you go. Just, just again, <laughs> thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. So, Appreciate you. Uh, um, anything else from the group you. here? Uh, any other announcements or any other comments? Um, uh, Brian Bigley, are you there? I see he's there, but I don't know. Brian. <laughs> I don't know if your mic works. Oh, well. Anyway, well, um, I, I guess a question based on, on the... Uh, uh, I put a question on the chat, Mike, and I didn't hear anybody respond to it. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I missed it. Does anyone have any, is this the paving paving question? Why don't you go ahead and ask it? Yeah, I mean, to me, I've seen even in my own street where the utilities have come in with concrete cutters 
to repair irrigation valves and to fix utility poles and things like that. And, you know, I think that if we could encourage not only SDG&E, but the various water departments and the cities um, to budget a certain amount every year to depaving, that would go a long way to finding places to plant new trees. And I don't hear it talked about, but it is something that exists around the country and we have a particularly high problem with it here, particularly in the older, poorer neighborhoods. Thoughts on that? But yeah, I think you bring up a valid point, but. One, one little update actually, we're talking with Urban Corps and Urban Corps in their current grant is actually looking at just doing that, the logistics of bringing in some concrete cutters into place like uh, Barrio Logan and freeing up some more dirt. But again, you know, the huge logistical headache that entails and there'll just be tons of areas that because the infrastructure aren't gonna work. But yeah, we're, there's at least some discussion about that uh, very thing. So give you a little hope, hopefully, Robin. Well, given the size of the tree wells that often are used in cities, which aren't very big to begin with, uh, I mean, I've seen them cut out four by four or five by five openings. And I believe the city of San Diego now requires five by eight. Uh, but there's a lot of places where parkways exist that just simply were paved over. So they're, they're actually there. They just, we just need to expose the soil again. The city yeah. has the jurisdiction um, in many cases. In fact, in most cases, you know, they're, they're not utility easements. They're just places where maybe residents have paved over or somebody did in the past and nobody knows anymore. Probably illegally, but, you know, again, I, I hear kind of like it's not available, but actually it is. Yeah, we found lots of parkways where people had done just that, bricked it over, and then you go and try and talk them into undoing that and planting a tree. That's the hardest sell there is. Uh, the other thing is with the cities, if the meridians or parkways are out there, is the irrigation still viable? And the other sticking point is, you know, they don't want to spend money on water, which is sad. But, you know, right. those are all... You know, I've seen um, City of Vista a few years ago actually did uh, innovative concrete cutting where they cut on the back side of the sidewalk adjacent to the properties where irrigation was a little bit easier from an accessibility access. standpoint mm -hmm. as opposed to cutting putting the tree out closer to the street side so they, they cut the concrete on the back side of the sidewalk which I thought was pretty interesting on that well subject. and I can tell you in my neighborhood I simply just throw some sandbags down when it rains and it it actually throws the water right up into my parkway and it waters the trees I have out there. So just simply, you know, changing the way we manage stormwater can also help most of the year when we do have rains to channel it toward those parkways rather than away from them. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of innovation that can happen. And I think, mm -hmm. again, the city, the city technically in most cases owns those parkways and I, I mean, I don't think that it should only be just a resident saying, well, I don't want a freaking tree. Well, you know, the city does have a say in what goes on on those, those places. Yeah, it is true. Well, some good conversation points there. Um, so uh, is there anything else that would like to be discussed? Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I think I'm good with the journey if we're all in agreement. Yeah. All right. So um, our next meeting will be um, October 4th, I believe, or 6th, October 6th. And uh, we'll get back to you on the topic. Appreciate everybody's participation. Enjoy the rest of your <laughs> Talk to you later. Thanks, Mike.